So we were, you should have been recording this. We could have just like we could have done a whole bonus episode. <laughs> done a bonus pre- episode of our pre-show warm-up of talk. Our, yeah, we should do that next time. Just turn on the just turn on the mics and like, get some. Let us let us talk it out. We can we can ramble. We certainly can. That's for sure. Maybe you can take elements of it and just like piece it together to be like this Frankenstein yeah. episode. And you're just like, <laughs> <laughs> this is not one of our <laughs> prize <laughs> prize yeah, episodes. So over the years, we'll eventually just build a a, a, a library of. Um, Clips of us talking about things that aren't connected necessarily, but good stuff to talk about. The Popstorian Podcast with Chris and Ben. Wait a minute. You ain't heard nothing yet. Greatest crash in the history of the New York Stock Exchange. And market a market. date which will live in infamy. I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. What are you supposed to do when you see the flash? Yeah. <laughs> And I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Well, I'm not a crook. Might have gotten away with it, too. If it wasn't for these blasted kids and their dogs. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. The evil of the river. Ah! I can hear you. The rest of the world hears you. Great power great responsibility who are you who am i yeah who oh, are you chris keating <laughs> hello chris i'm ben hi ben it's like we just we first met here and we're already Wait, fast we, friends and on our third episode we're on our third episode already yeah um how do you think it's going so far you know i think after this this has the potential to be our best episode yet because they they're getting better every time. Potential. That's a great word, potential. <laughs> potential of do or, many things. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Pop Story and Podcast where we have a lot of potential. Pop Story and Podcast potential. Your triple P. So, welcome to Pop Story and Podcast where history and popular culture collide. I read that on your notes here. Is that our new That's new, our our new catchphrase? I think it's on the website, too. Is it? I need yeah. to look it up, man. <laughs> I have been slacking so bad. <laughs> Haven't we all? We're going to take a look at the next film in our series, which is... Westerns by the Decade. Well, yes, but what's, but... The, what's the film? <laughs> oh, yeah. The film is called The Covered Wagon from 1923. 1923. A Paramount Pictures production. Big deal. A big deal film. This is our film for the 1920s, in case uh, you missed the other episodes. We're going decade by decade through uh, the great westerns of uh, the 20th century, and maybe into the 21st century a little bit as well. Maybe. So our film for the 1920s is this one, The Covered Wagon, directed by James Cruz. James Cruz, starring Kerrigan. J. Warren Kerrigan. J. Warren Kerrigan, and Alan Hale. Alan Hale is the supporting, uh, well, the villain. He is the main villain. And uh, Lois Wel- Wilson as the heroine. And a, a memorable supporting role from Ernest Torrance as uh, William Jackson, the guide of the uh, Jackson. He's by far our favorite character in that film, I yes, think. Yes. Know. So uh, should we get into a synopsis? I'm going to let you do that. Should I, should I include spoilers or go the no spoiler version? Oh, you got to do spoilers. So I think if you haven't watched the movie... You should, and you want to know, you, you, you're like, you want to watch this film before we ruin it for you. Right. Stop um, the episode right now. Pause this podcast. Don't delete it. Just pause it. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't delete us. We're, we're just... Go watch the movie. You can watch it on YouTube. It's available all over the place. It entered into the public domain. It did this past recently. year. Yep. This uh, very January. Year. Was it the 1st of January? Yep. January 1st, public domain day, 2019. So you have no excuse. Go watch it. It's a good film. You'll enjoy it. Actually, it is a good film. So yeah, basically this this uh, story is about two wagon trains heading from what was then called Westport, Missouri, going across the country to Oregon. So basically, it's an Oregon Trail adventure story. Yes. And it uh, well, I don't I don't know how to put it. The, well, it's the it, dynamic there. It's kind of just a story of the rough life of a pioneer headed west mm-hmm. with a lot of adventures like river crossing, mm-hmm. buffalo hunting, Indian attack, 
mm-hmm. and of course the icy icy slopes of the Rockies. Yes. And you were telling that you you meet two young men yep. vying for the affections of this this woman. That's kind of our story that's interwoven throughout. You've got our, our heroic cowboy type, played yep. by Kerrigan, who is uh, Captain Banyan. Captain Banyan, who is kind of uh, under suspicion at the beginning of the film. He's been kicked out of the uh, U.S. Army. U.S. Army for yeah. under suspicious circumstances. Cattle rustling. Cattle rustling is the accusation yeah. leveled against him, and I guess he just you know. Instead of dealing with the court martial, he took off. <laughs> yeah, they're not very clear on that. They don't really explain it, but he's leading one of the two wagon trains, and the two wagon trains kind of join up in Westport. The other young man is part later of the Kansas City. Other, no, is it Kansas? City? Oh, you're right, it is Kansas City. The other young man, played by Alan Hale, and he's part of the other wagon train, and he's got he's the main love interest of the young lady in question. But apparently, mm-hmm. he's not as up and up as. He no, was. he's a very sketchy dude. Yeah. But uh, the. This young lady's father, who's kind of the head of the, we'll call them the the farmer train, the non Will Banyan train. What we call them the plow train. The plow train. The plow train, and the the others will call, what they call them the Liberty Boys. In the movie. <laughs> so the Liberty Boys and the plows. Right. So you've got your the two... men of the plow. Excuse me. <laughs> the men you've of got the your two wagon trains. Your your men of the plow and your your Liberty train. Liberty train led by our hero, and the. Uh, the other train led by the father of the heroine. So, dude man of the plow is... Dude uh, man of the... I feel like you need to be more <laughs> more descriptive of who this dude man of the plow is. The, the, the father of our heroine okay, sorry. Is, uh, is really gung-ho to go to Oregon. And uh, the villain of the piece is really gung-ho to, to marry his daughter. So he's kind of along for the ride. But... The daughter takes an exceptional interest early on in uh, in the heroic uh, Banyan. Yeah. So you've got that drama right away. And Alan Hale's character basically does everything he can to uh, subvert and... Uh, and Ben and I really couldn't figure out why. Because there's really no... I mean, there's one conflict between these two guys, but then other than that, they don't really interact with each other. Yeah, the the driving force of the conflict is that they're interested in the same woman. Yeah, but, uh, then... but that, but later on, that that kind hey. of yeah, we're getting ahead. we're getting ahead of ourselves here. So yeah, they they kind of go out from uh, Kansas City and go forth on their adventure, and they have some hard times. They have some good times. They're they're being led by. This guide, who's played by uh, Torrance, and uh, he's pretty much the driving force of the story in a lot of ways because he's kind of for the first act, because he's kind of dictating where they go and what they run into, and he definitely is. He's <laughs> even he even gives great advice on buffalo hunting. The best way to hunt a buffalo mm-hmm. is with a bow and arrow. He does say that mystifyingly. I don't know. I'm not a buffalo hunter, but, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure you probably need more than a bow and arrow. That didn't strike me as the... I mean, if you need a, a extra big gun, like a buffalo rifle. <laughs> well, apparently they didn't have those because yeah, I, in, no, the, they did, in the no, buffalo they scene, uh, Banyan's even like going after him with a pistol. Did you see that? Yeah, he was riding he was. He had, like a little pistol. He's riding with his six shooter, and then, blasting away at the buffalo. And then Jim Bridger, who shows up in the film, I forget uh-huh. who plays him, but he shows up and kills buffalo with a knife. Yep, our his- historical figure rolling up. So I feel like uh, I feel like he's a pretty weak buffalo in the film. Uh, Tully Marshall, who played Bridger, is, is the uh, the actor who plays Bridger. Yeah, and he is actually a historical figure. Um, I'm not a, a st- student of uh, the early West, um, so I don't really know a whole lot about him, and I neglected to look him up since I was focusing more on the 20th century this yes. time around. But he is real. He is a real figure, yes. So they, they meet this guy uh, while they're out buffalo hunting, this trapper. They go back and have some whiskey, and it turns out that uh, Banyan was actually uh, discharged of the... Or uh, relieved of the charges against him. By none other than Abe Lincoln. By Abe Lincoln. So a little bit of historical name dropping thrown in throughout. Yeah. 
This is set in uh, 1849. Yeah, 48 through 49. 48 through 49, so close to when the gold rush would have happened. Around, uh, later on in the film, that becomes a factor. About this time in the film, actually. So, yeah. um, They're losing a lot of guys going to California. As, uh, as Bridger's getting drunk and hearing this news, the trapper and the trailblazer are hearing this news about Banyan getting, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Exonerated? Exonerated, yeah, that's the word. He's, uh, as he's getting exonerated, they also hear about uh, gold being struck in California. So you've got, you know, the Oregon Trail isn't the only, like, historical uh, event that they try to roll up into this film. 49er Gold Rush. They mentioned the Gold Rush and Abe Lincoln. And... Yeah. So it's... When was Abe Lincoln first elected president? In uh, 1860. So he wouldn't... Where would he have been in 1849? Would he have been a senator at that point? Or... Um, I think he's... Well, shoot, you put me on the spot now. Yeah, I don't... Well, I'm asking because I don't know. Because he's in Illinois still at this point. I don't think he is very successful in politics. In 1849? In 49. I think he may have run for representative. Um, but I don't feel like he's, he's very successful at this point. And, and in the film, they mention that he's a lawyer, this young lawyer from Illinois. Um, okay. So, so they just... I'm going really... gonna, gonna to hope that the uh, historian that they... I'm sure that they talked to while making this film um, and did his research. Historical about consultant. His consult, the historical consultant on this I film. I mean, it would have to be a pretty darn good lawyer to get this guy off if he, like, deserted and went off. You know, I've watched a lot of Westerns, and Abe Lincoln's always depicted as a good lawyer. I don't know if that's really historically accurate. I need to go back and, and read. Refresh on Abe Lincoln. I've actually, I don't think I've ever read all the way through a Lincoln biography and that's something I've always even, been remiss um, about. Doris Cairns Goodwins? Did I've, she write a Lincoln? Um that's Team of Rivals and I've that's been on my list for so yeah, long. So many years. Um actually the book recommended to me was Lincoln by David Herbert Donald. Uh-huh, uh, I'm looking right at it. And I haven't uh, haven't picked that up yet. Yeah, me neither. So this this episode is actually showing how weak I am as the historian part of this <laughs> podcast. Thank you, Ben, for, <laughs> well, for pointing this all out. You can go ahead and uh, put me on the spot later for some some film questions that I actually you put me on the spot earlier today before we were recording about which, the which, Hayes Code. Oh yeah, some right. Dates on that that I was pretty fuzzy on because this this film takes place around the time when the Hayes Code is kind of being put in but not really <laughs> we were talking about that earlier is that it's it actually kind of becomes a hard code by you said 34 yeah 1934 and then uh but we were reading up on it and it's actually kind of sort of being eased into it by 22 at the earliest yeah they were already after the uh the whole incident with the fatty arbuckle murders yeah. um they were kind of there was kind of an outcry for More. someone to bring moral decency to the to hollywood hollywood. Uh, hollywood scene yeah so that's happening around the same time that this movie is being made. Yeah, should I have a question here? Should I put in because I have some points to make about two scenes in the film, and then I also have, of course, the context of what's going on. So, so what do you want to? Either Let's finish the roll synopsis out? if we can manage it. <laughs> this film, <laughs> even the synopsis, man. So we were watching this film, and we're, this is a really long film. It actually only times to an hour thirty eight minutes. It feels longer. It's very sprawling and epic. So we're at the point where Banyan, uh, Bridger, and Torrance's character, what's, he, what's even his name? <laughs> it's Billy Jackson. That's his name. Billy Jackson? Billy Jackson. William Jackson. Known as Billy. I'm not even making that up. I actually, that's actually the... You, the, you actually know. I actually looked that up. Um... So yeah, so they know that he's been exonerated, but they don't tell him right away because they get distracted by shooting at each other. Um, not in an unfriendly way, they're just having a shooting match where they shoot stuff off of each other's head. Well, intoxicated. Well, intoxicated. And this will show up in a number of questions later on. I feel like I should put that in there. Yes, you should. Th- this, is a <laughs> this is an interesting film in terms of uh, what is and isn't okay to put in a film. 
Yeah, it is actually. Because there's also a, a. Should we talk about this? We shouldn't. We should finish the synopsis. I'm desperate to finish. <laughs> this is gonna be the whole episode. <laughs> Just like talking about the film us, while we try to finish the synopsis. Derailed. Yeah. So the the two trains uh, split again. They do. Um, Alan Hale's train is attacked by Indians. The uh, there's a small boy who kind of, I guess. Is the brother of the heroine, maybe? That's what I get the impression of. They're never actually explicit, but I think that's... They're never, think that's they're he's never, always around. Yeah, it's never explicitly stated, but he's always kind of hanging around uh, Captain of the Plowman and his daughter, so yeah, he so could be a son. I think he's a son. It's, it's, I mean, his wife, the Plowman's wife is, like, really attached to this kid, too. He gets, True. She, she gives him yeah. hugs and stuff. So I'm thinking he's, like, the yeah. older brother. So. so he sneaks off. Gets the other wagon train. There's a, a big reunion. They defeat the Indians. Eventually recover from their wounds. The damage done. And they, they split they, again. Split again. Half going down to California. Half going north to Oregon. Uh, the plow commander, uh, of course, is bound for Oregon. He's not distracted by gold. Unlike uh, Ellen Hale's character. Right. Well, Sam think, Woodhull. Well, Sam Woodhull. I knew that. But I feel like... It's it's because we're not used to watching silent films. We're used to like yeah. people talk, saying their names over and over and over again. That Jack, the fa- Rose, <laughs> exactly. Rose, Jack, <laughs> the fact and the fact that we have to read their names when they're yeah. introduced and then you never hear them again. Yeah, I think that's probably our problem. That's here. definitely a factor. So, it's been an enjoyable time. It's confusing in audio too. If you listen to audio dramas or anything like that, old time radio, it is kind of awkward because you, they'll be like saying the name and then uh-huh. they'll saying what exactly what they're doing and like who talks like that. And if they're if they're similarly voiced at all, it's so easy to get them mixed, mixed up. up. I had that experience while listening to The Hobbit recently. Yeah, and that has nothing to do with this episode, but I feel like I should tell you but that it's related. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, so let's... this has been a pop story and podcast tangent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they split they split ways and the villain of the piece Woodhull is is just uh you know, a scandalous figure. He's headed he, uh, to California. Yeah, he's headed to California to get the gold even though he's basically engaged to be married to this girl. Yeah. He gives her up for the opportunity to and they were, like, gold. supposed to be married, like, right before the Indian attack happened. They're, like, getting married. Yeah, the wedding's about to be happening. And they're, they get interrupted. And she gets wounded. She does. Spoiler she gets alert. She gets wounded. Um, also, backstory for the villain that we haven't really mentioned. During the buffalo hunt, he tries to shoot down... Banyan. His rival, Banyan. Yeah. And uh, in the process, falls into a bog. So he's not very sort of... competent of a bad guy? No, no. But he is a villain because he actually shoots a guy in cold blood, and so we we know that he's he's well established he as a bad guy. He shoots a ferryman. Yeah, and, for, and instead of paying the fare, he's just like, "I'm not going to pay you." And he shoots the guy. Yeah, so, because he's an Indian, basically. Basically, like, you're, so, you're all savages, and I don't owe you any money. So I'm going to go back to that in a minute here. Talk about Native Americans. There's so much. In this film. There's so much to talk about in this film. They're really and we're having trouble getting through this now. <laughs> so much trouble. <laughs> Anyway, they end up getting to Oregon. The plowman, his wife, his daughter, because uh, Woodhull leaves her. They set up a farm. They pray, thank God, for land and plows. And then, uh, and you, you sneak. Meanwhile, Banyan's gone to California, too, with the rest of his train. And he's been panning for gold, because he makes it there. Uh-huh. Um, and then Billy Jackson meets up with his old friend, and they start talking Turns out, uh, Banyan, they cook bacon. They do cook bacon in that scene. It's a really great scene. They find a, he, Banyan had found a lot of gold, and so now he's wealthy and ready to yes. meet his lady love in Oregon because she is waiting for him there. Mm-hmm. So the message goes by Billy Jackson. Mm-hmm. But while this is all happening, Woodhall is now waiting in the bushes with a rifle ready to kill Banyan as he walks out <laughs> his cabin, which he then is in turn killed by Jackson through the window. And that's it. That's pretty much ends. Of the I, day. I have to say, th- there's kind of a lot of scenes. Yeah, that's pretty much the end of the film. He that's goes back. Much, he goes to Oregon. And he goes to Oregon. They, they reunite. They reunite. Very touching scene. They look into each other's eyes longingly. Uh-huh. And then they don't kiss. They don't kiss. That, they just embrace. That was... Uh, and it's not a very, like, 
Hollywood is. It's not as satisfying. <laughs> it's just like end. <laughs> after all that, yeah. So it's and it's weird because it's like the perfect ending too. All the characters survive, except for Widow. Except for the villain. Yeah. And you know, you would think like somebody has to sacrifice along the way mm-hmm. through all the hardships that they endure. No, nobody does. It's very like Hollywood, like feel good kind of ending. And then, you know... They don't kiss. No kiss. That really bothered me. I'm sorry. I brought that it up. bothered me, too. But um, that ends the movie. Yeah. We finally got so through you, the synopsis. You got this, we finally got through the synopsis. You got this character of uh, of Woodhull and the rivalry between him and Banyan, and that's pretty much the only driving element of the story, other than, oh, we're just going to follow these people as they travel. From Missouri to Oregon. Yeah. yeah. So just events happen to them. It is. It's kind of like a... Uh, almost like a necklace and they kind of hang these different charms on it like mm-hmm. okay so they must have crossed a river somewhere so mm-hmm. check that's done they had to get food so let's have them hunt buffalo check that's done yep of course there is indian so there has to be an indian tack check that's done mm-hmm. and then we have to cross a mountain okay they're going through snow yep. they got that they've got the the somebody dies they had the funeral and then there's a birth there's a birth the same there's time. a wedding or there's a wedding. almost wedding yep interrupted by indian attack so life goes on so the only real like driving element is the love triangle yeah that's like the conflict and the the story of it and i'm going to bring up my seat here if if i want to interrupt you right here go ahead and be like this is the one scene that really shocked me all right so we've been watching some westerns and they're all silent and they're all very different from what i'm used to watching movies Uh uh-huh but this scene like, I thought I was prepared. I thought I was like, all right, I'm watching it from a 21st century mindset. I realized that their view on women is a little bit different. It's going to be it's going to be different in the movies. Mm-hmm. This scene shocked me. So, in this film, the captains of the wagon trains are together and talking. And for some reason, Molly, who is the heroine of the film, asks Banyan if she can ride his horse. Banyan looks at her and says, my horse is too much for any woman. Basically, that's what she what he says. So I'm like, whoa, that's kind of a, like you're just a yeah. woman. You can't ride my horse. Yeah, but it gets better than this. I'm like, okay, uh-huh. I get it. This is the 20s. All right, I understand. But then she turns to Alan Hale's character, who is the we've probably established is the villain at this point. Yeah, and he says, "You can ride my horse and climb aboard. Climb aboard and show him how much of a rider you actually are." Uh huh. All right. So when you look at this from a modern point of view. Who's the bad guy here? <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> Who's really the bad guy from a modern point of view? Oh, definitely Banyan. From a Banyan right there. So I'm like, okay. This well, is even, co- this even is not even from a modern point of view, he was definitely like harsh. and he was, Yeah, he was just kind of a jerk to her. He, he was. And then Alan Hale's just like, you know what? Don't listen to him. You can do what you want to do. You can do this. Yeah. He's, he's empowering. He's empowering. He's friendly. He's and you're just like, this is confusing me. And then, <laughs> and then this is just the topper right here. She gets on the horse. The horse sp- spooks, runs away, mm-hmm. proving Banyan was right mm-hmm. that he she could not ride a Women horse. Women can't handle Women horses. can't handle horses. And of course, Banyan gets on the horse and runs and saves her. Uh-huh. And you know what she does? She just looks at him longingly. Uh-huh. Just like, you rescued me. Uh-huh. This. <laughs> So confused me. This is a woman who's in other scenes of the movie shown driving the wagon. She is described as the spunky heroine. Yeah. In one book that I read. Not very spunky. Not not as spunky in this one. As a matter of fact, she doesn't do much for most of the movie except This surprises me because and it shouldn't have surprised me, but it it did that because uh the nineteenth amendment is just passed only four years earlier. Mm -hmm. So it shouldn't surprise me that empowerment of women is not like up at their Yeah, not what we would expect today, but yeah. So, By the same token, she's, I mean, she's hardly a character in the movie at all, really. They really she's, don't. She's there, but she, she, what, she's basically a foil that serves to pine after Banyan and frustrate the villain. Yeah. <laughs> and you're just like, why is this character here? She has one, I think, one really great scene, and that's when she's helping the little girl with their doll. Right. I think that's... But then Banyan movie. comes over. And, and of course Banyan comes over and like actually saves the day. Yeah, but there's a great to... scene where he uh, he makes a doll. Or he, so... he makes a new head for this doll that's broken. <laughs> and it's so... it's a creepy... <laughs> it's a really creepy doll. Like... It's like a Frankenstein of dolls. Yeah, it looks, it looks like a really primitive aboriginal 
piece of art or something. It's just not very effective as a as a doll. As a doll. <laughs> I don't know. I've seen a lot of dolls, and that is. Uh, I mean, what he uses a tobacco pouch for the head. I think that's what it is. So anyway, um, but anyway, that's my two cents on just my point of view looking yeah. backwards, and I guess feminism uh, as a, a topic of the time. Mm-hmm. So you can no other real female characters to speak of. Her mother, and then this little girl. Her mother's hardly there at all. She talks I mean, to her father like twice. I think, yeah, she's just um, kind of a bit part. So. And and of course Jim Bridger's two wives. And Jim Bridger has two wives. He's yeah. married to two Indians, named uh, <laughs> well, what are they called again? Like Dang Your Eyes and. Uh, yeah, he had some very colorful names for them. Um, Whoop Your Hide, I think, is the other one. Yeah, I think you might be right. Something like that. Blast and Your Hide. There we blast go. Blast Your Hide. Blast Your Hide and Dang, dang Your eyes. Dang Your or Dang eyes. Your Eyes. Yeah. Anyway. Could, what were you? I'm sorry, I'm interrupting you, but uh, that scene just kind of shocked me of any any of the scenes yeah. in the film. It's uh, it's interesting because it was definitely. I mean, this movie was made from uh, a novel by Emerson Howe, mm-hmm. and uh, Howe's novel is a big hit. Howe's a very successful novelist. He wrote his first big blockbuster was uh, something called the Mississippi Bubble. Miss- bubble. Mississippi Bubble. Uh, the Mississippi Bubble is a big hit and it's about how they opened up this land in Mississippi and a bunch of, you know, settlers ran down there and were purchasing land and then the market collapsed. I think it's interesting to compare that to the the bubbles that we have nowadays Mm -hmm. in real estate a few years back, 2008, and that whole crisis that arose. It's an interesting parallel that that is still a factor back then as well as now. It's very interesting to kind of see certain issues never are resolved or yeah. yeah they're resolved but then something new pops up and it's kind of the same deal and you don't really learn from it so that catapults how into a career as a fiction writer before that he was a writer editor for field and stream and a contributor to the saturday evening post a uh, very prolific and successful writer and a friend of pat garrett pat garrett who was very famous as a lawman shooting billy the kid mm-hmm um, there's actually quite a few westerns made about Billy the Kid and Pat Garrett. Yes, there are. Um, I've not actually seen Billy the Kid and Pat Garrett. I think that's the probably the most Pat, famous one. Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. Yeah, Pat, there it is. The one I've seen is actually called Chisholm, which of course is a John Williams oh, yeah. film in the 60s. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that depicts uh, Lincoln County War. Um, but uh, yeah, he, kind of, he, he writes a book about uh, outlaws. Yeah, connected to figures of the real West. Yeah. So he writes this novel, sells the serialization rights to uh, the Saturday Evening Post for 15000 Pretty good sum. Oh, wow. And then uh, he sells the rights to Paramount, or Famous Players, the subsidiary of Paramount, mm-hmm. for double that amount. So, put, so the movie rights were $30,000. Is that above and beyond the budget? Because the budget was 780000 it would have been that thirty thousand would have come out of that seven hundred. Okay, so that's that's in the seven hundred eighty thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's so it's a good chunk of change. It is a good chunk of change. That in today's money, the budget for this movie would be almost twelve million dollars. Yeah. When you compl- as far as we can tell, and this it, is the big budget of the time. This is right. a huge epic sweeping tale. Yeah, it's pretty comparable oh. to I think. I want to say, I could be wrong about this, but I want to say that uh, Griffith's Intolerance, which I guess is the considered one of the first major American epics, like yeah. this film considered a but major American epic. And, and that's almost, what, twice as long as this film? Yeah, that's like twice as long as this film, and I think it's around $14 million Okay. equivalent. Wow. So it's, you know, and 14 all, versus 12. It would be equivalent in money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is, I have to say, an impressive film in terms of scenery and staging... It it's is. almost all filmed on location. Which is a huge deal at the time. Mm-hmm. He films it in Utah, in Nevada. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's all these wagons. There's like 70 wagons, you said? Massive. I mean, you can you can see in the wine shots they've got, you know, and this, there's... I couldn't detect any matte painting, but it almost mm-hmm. looks like matte painting because there's, it's so sweeping. And one scene, I almost thought it was a matte painting. Uh, the scene where... Uh, Billy Jackson meets up with Banyan in California in his cabin, that one scene. Um, you kind of see his cabin on the left, 
mm -hmm. in the middle of the picture, and then up in the uh, background, there's a mountains and a valley. Huge mountainscape. And you're just like, was that real? Or did, I mean, I would assume it's real. Mm -hmm. But it looked, that's the only time I can think of that actually looked like it was a map painting. Yep. Very impressive. Beautiful film. Yeah, great uh, use of landscape, which of course became like a hallmark of John Ford, who releases his own Western epic the following year. Yes, he does. Called The Iron Horse. Which I imagine is probably more famous than The Covered Wagon is today. Today, yeah, because of Ford, more what Ford Ford. does later. More than Ford. And uh, uh, this film is directed by James Cruz, who is not very famous. He's done a few smaller films uh, with... Fatty Arbuckle, uh-huh. um, which I guess is not, not more really famous the, for directing his comedy shorts. Not really the sweeping uh, epics that you see in this. Yeah, film. this was uh, breaking new ground for him and for the industry at the time. It's interesting yeah. though that they filmed some in Utah because that's where uh, Cruz originally hailed from. Yes, he was uh, of Mormon extraction, although he left the faith in his teen years, according to some accounts. And I'm going to jump in here to a couple of things I read online that sure. I don't know, just feel like I should throw in here is that yeah. there's rumors that he was part Ute from being you know, in Utah and that he actually disguises himself in the background as a Native American. Yeah. Um, which I did not spot him. So I don't no, know. No, I, 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 I read that that scene was actually cut. <laughs> that the, uh, the screenwriter came back to him and said, look, you can't, people are going to recognize you. Because he was an actor as well. He was, also. yeah. That's true. So, uh,. <laughs> People are like, you're, you're going to be recognized if you're standing in the background of this shot. I guess this was before the the idea of the Hitchcock cameo, the director's cameo, became like a thing. I mean, Peter Jackson now has done yeah. that. Uh -huh. and lots of directors. Lots of directors. Do George that. Lucas in uh, Revenge That's of right. the Sith. George Lucas did that too. But anyway, yeah. this, anyway. Is, this is before a lot of directors do that, I guess. Hitchcock appears in almost all of his movies. <laughs> well, see, the, he wasn't the first to do that, though. No, but he kind of made it his own, he made it much the same way that D.W. Griffith made the silent movie era his own. <laughs> he just did it by pure will. He's just like, I claim this as mine. Yeah, or Thomas Edison made electricity, you know, everything. <laughs> He's like, oh, you invented a nice thing. It'd be a shame if someone took that. Um, <laughs> someone invented that. Um, but anyway, uh, we can't get away from Griffith. We got to do an episode on Griffith. No, he always comes up. Um, so what is your, the other, the other scene, I'm going to put this in here too, and this is going to bring up uh, one of Ben's favorite points about the film. Mm. In this, in this scene, the film doesn't actually talk about Native Americans very much at all. They, they pop up every once in a while. But one of the main points in it was that after a meeting of the wagon train leaders are talking about a plow, the, the main wagon, the, we call him the plow man because he's talking about this plow to one of his followers, and he's very much, uh, uh, very much attached to this plow, apparently. Yes. And then the scene is is almost mirrored by a scene of Native Americans around a plow, mm -hmm. and their argument is that this plow is a weapon. Yes. And this is against our ways, and it's interesting to kind of see that uh, from a historical point of view is that they're kind of showing Native Americans not necessarily as oh I would say that kind of the idea of noble savage. That they're a people, but their people, their ways are, are outdated, and they we, they yeah. need to move past this. Yeah. And the uh, and they're they're in the film they're showing them it's like we refuse to give up our ways. Yeah. And this is this idea that you see again and again and again in throughout Westerns. Uh, throughout westerns and film yeah. in other genres as well. Mm -hmm. And it's all surrounding this plow, and I thought that very interesting the plow motif throughout the whole yeah. film. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, a, a symbol that, that permeates the whole thing, really. It does. It shows up quite frequently. Yeah. Yeah. Potent symbolism. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how much I want to get into the, the symbolism the of symbolism the plow. The symbolism of the plow. <laughs> we, could speculate, we could speculate about that a good bit. Um, um, the, the plow is a symbol of, of uh, civilization. and Civilization so and definitely, also fertility. Definitely, and definitely a major. Kind of like fruitfulness. Two major themes in this film, I feel yeah. like. Uh, moving civilization west. So Manifest Destiny, of course, is, is kind of raises its yeah. head again in, yeah. in a new media yeah. uh, form. And uh, going forth and multiplying and creating a, a civilization of 
of a better world, I guess, is, Basically, is yeah. what they're trying to do here. S- subjecting uh, nature and wildness to man's domain. Yeah, and in, isn't, don't they even say in the film at some point, like, using this land properly or something like that? Maybe not. Maybe I'm just something, that something similar to But that. they kind of give that impression in a lot of the, the images that they yeah. use. Yeah. It's very much... Uh, there. There's no question that the filmmakers felt like they were doing the right thing by colonizing. And Indians are kind of... Indians are kind of depicted in three different ways. There's kind of the scene that you talked about mm-hmm. where they're depicted as kind of like somewhat noble but really Out, backward. Like outdated, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then there's the ferryman Indians who are submissive. And they, they treat it almost like they're below our recognition. Even so yeah. much as uh, Woodall's character, the character Woodall, uh-huh. shoots one of them in the face for right. not, and not, doesn't bother to pay them. Right. Um, Which isn't depicted as a good thing. No. <laughs> but at the same time, it's it's kind of like they're, they are there to uh, be submissive to the, the white man's needs while while trying to be kind of uh, scallywaggy about it and overcharge for their... For their services. For their services. Yeah. So there's that depiction. And then there's just the wild savages of the plains who, who attack, attack them, them in the canyon. Yeah. And you almost... I almost thought that they were going to have like this Native American ten- continued like following the wagon train because uh-huh. they, they introduce Native Americans so early on in the film. Yeah. But, but they, they don't. don't really. They introduce actually a number of different tribes throughout the film. I don't know if you, they, they talked about the, uh, the Pawnee and they talked about, yeah. I think they talked about the Ute. There's a, another one that they mentioned later on uh-huh. in the film as well. Um, but there's no... Very briefly. Yeah, there's no uh, connection there either. Yeah. So we're talking about the story being kind of just yeah. falling There's no around. characters. There isn't no Native there's no characters in the Native American. They're just kind of set pieces. A, a, a obstacle to be over mm-hmm. overcome. And mm-hmm. that's one another big theme in this film. So that extends into the making of the film too, because you get uh what's his name? Tim McCoy? Yes, I'm right. Tim McCoy uh is a guy who later becomes an actor and a star in his own right. But at this point, he was just kind of known as an expert on Native American culture. So the studio calls him up and is like, can you, uh, can you bring us some Indians? We need lots of Indians. No <laughs> kidding. <laughs> and this guy is like, sure. So he gets a bunch of, you know, Native American people from all over, and he brings them to the set, and he's basically like their wrangler, <laughs> telling them where to go and what to do. And uh, that's how the director... Got all the Indians for his movie. I was wondering about, well, maybe not that specifically. I know John Ford was very famously in, in uh, brought in a lot of Navajo mm-hmm. uh, Native Americans to to his films and kind of gave them money on the reservation and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but their battle tactics, I don't think I've ever seen or heard of these tactics being used in reality. Um, <laughs> They have like an infantry cavalry <laughs> movement here, or pincer movement, where yeah. the cavalry rush in, almost falling off a cliff. And in one case, one actually did fall off a cliff. Yes. And then they had infantry sneaking up in bushes. Uh, not just bushes, but like them holding up a bush. And sort of Roman-esque up. shields, almost, yeah, made out of these bushes. Yeah, but not very, like they were just Primitive. disguised. They're for disguise. <laughs> it's disguise. They weren't there for... <laughs> It was not a protection disguise. <laughs> <laughs> they, they weren't there for protection, for sure. They drop the they drop them as soon as they get going. That's true. That's true. Um, so I'm like, I never heard of them doing. It almost it's, it's it kind of weird of, because they cut from like night. Like the attack starts at night during the wedding, right? And, and then, then it's daylight. And it's like they didn't attack till till daylight. They they yeah. started it like we're here, and then they wait until daylight to actually yeah. initiate the attack. The bushes just kind of threw me off because I'm like, this is not Peter Pan. What are we doing here? <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen the musical Peter Pan, but of course, Ben, you know, save the day. At, at that time. So you've got uh, Tim McCoy is one of the interesting people who worked on this film. Another one is uh, Hugh J. Plays, Warren Kerrigan. Who plays Captain Banyan. Who plays Banyan. So uh, Kerrigan is a major star at this point. He's been in a lot of successful movies. And uh, he's interesting because... Both him and co-star Lois Wilson, although they play love interests in this movie, never married. Uh, they were both single for all their life, and uh, Kerrigan is believed by historians to have been possibly gay 
Okay. Closeted gay figure. Was he? Uh, he kept a secretary for all of his life. A um, male secretary? A male secretary. Okay. And a lot of people speculate that he was uh, a partner. Um, but of course, but nothing came out in the news because there's no, was there's, squeaky there's clean no yeah. Hollywood. Yeah, gotcha. he was a squeaky clean kind of Hollywood guy until he made some comments. Um, this was actually before this film. He uh, was asked by reporters if he would be joining up to fight in World War One, and he said, "I'm not afraid to go out and fight for my country." But I feel like all the, the lower class people who don't have anything to offer society should go first. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. He, he made comments very much. I'm paraphrasing, but that's pretty close to what he said. Wow. And when he says this, of course, and the, the reporters publish it, mm-hmm. it uh, immediately takes a huge nosedive On his in, career. His, in his career. So The Covered Wagon was kind of like his comeback film. Okay. But the following year, he was involved in a car accident that really damaged his face. So huh. it pretty much effectively ended his career as a film actor from that point on. Wow. Yeah. So he's, he's a very interesting character as well. Can you <laughs> get a role as a bad guy? I mean... <laughs> Evidently not. I don't know. I didn't see pictures of the damage, but it must have been extensive. Wow. Or maybe it just broke his spirit finally after having such a, you know, up and down roller coaster right. ride of a career. That's that's kind of interesting that you say that because I th- I think I even made a mention while we were watching the film how I think Alan Hale is better looking than Banyan. Yeah, so, and he's he's uh, taller and strappinger and I don't know he just he's got awesome beard this beard and facial hair that he does just... have that awesome facial hair. So anyway, I'm a Alan Hale fan. <laughs> I'm going to keep saying that. I didn't recognize him at first. You had to point him out to me. I'm ashamed to admit. I'm surprised he played a bad guy, actually. I've never seen him in a bad guy role. He was fantastic. He was. Um, Of course. I'll read you a bit of Kerrigan's statement here. I'm not going to war. I will go, of course, if my country needs me. But I think that first they should take the great mass of men who aren't good for anything else or are only good for the lower grades of work. Actors, musicians, great writers, artists of every kind. Isn't it a pity when people are sacrificed who are capable of such things, of adding beauty to the world? So clearly he thought of himself as, you know, a great artist. A great artist That this country couldn't afford to lose. (laughs) That's kind of interesting. I don't don't feel like there's a lot of people who would have disagreed with him, but that's very, very much not a PC thing to say in wartime. Yeah, well, even even at the time, it caused a lot of yeah, this kind he, of like he, elitist he, attitude. He said it almost killed his career. Yeah, but it's interesting. And a lot of his fans turned against it. <laughs> well, I was going to talk about like mass culture, like mass media cultures, that there are these huge fan bases for these actors yeah. and films. People are going to the movies to see these people. Yep. Um, previous to that, I don't really, I don't really know if that would have been the case. If, Prior to... Prior to, uh, what was it, the 20s, when people were actually going to movies. Yeah, I feel like it would have originated... I mean, most people talk about Mary Pickford and Charlie Chaplin yeah. as being kind of like the early ones, but uh, uh, Barrymore, John Barrymore mm-hmm. also was a big one. Even even Lon Chaney has something of his own following. People yeah. would go see his film. Lon Chaney movies for Lon Chaney. Yeah. So. Shall I talk about the, the context of the time period? And what's sure, yeah. On? That's a good segue. So 1920 through 1929 is our time period here. So Woodrow Wilson, president until 1921, but was succeeded by Warren G. Harding. And he's in office uh, only about two years when he, he dies of a heart attack, or officially dies of a heart attack. There's some speculation that he was poisoned, although it's kind of a, oh. a side. It's, it's kind of one of those theories that stick around, even though historians are like, eh, we're not so sure, you know. Kind of sketchy. Uh, one, the the theory is that his wife caught him cheating and his poison poisoned, was poisoned in him. But is it pretty well established that he was actually having an affair, or was that just? Uh, oh yeah. Okay, that's well done. Warren G. Harding got around a lot, um, so there is that speculation, and they didn't really like each other that much anyway, from what I understand. Yeah. So, but the official ruling is that he died of a heart attack. Um, actually, he died in San Francisco. 
in a hotel with a heart attack. Hmm. Um, and, Was he with a woman? <laughs> you know, I don't know. <laughs> um, interesting to look that up. But uh, Calvin, Silent Cal Coolidge, takes mm. over, and uh, he is president till March of 1929, and he is succeeded by Herbert Hoover. And Herbert Hoover had been in the, in, the administration. Uh, of Coolidge. Of Coolidge. Actually, of Harding as well. Harding actually... I was just reading up on him. He apparently had a mixed bag of uh, cabinet members, one of which he's actually, uh, that would be the Secretary of, I think, Interior, Albert Hall, is the first secretary to ever land in jail. Ooh. Well, yeah. Well, but then, of well, course, uh, <laughs> yeah, then, but of course, Secretary of Commerce, Herbert Hoover, becomes president. Right. So well, it, it kind of redeems the cabinet. That kind of gives you an idea of the, the scope or the... Uh -huh. the well, yeah, he, had, he was surrounded by a diverse group of voices. A <laughs> very diverse group of voices, as far as that goes. <laughs> um, but the 20s are also known as the Roaring 20s of the Jazz Age. Yep. Uh, first talkie takes place in the 20s, which I do want to point out that this is our last silent film of Westerns through... Uh, yes, it is. Westerns by the decade. Yep. Uh, so next time we'll Plus have... Plus we go back and do a round two at some point. Oh, more, more go silent back films. And do, well, or just do uh, Westerns by the decade two. Oh, we could do that. That'd be fun. There's enough westerns. Yeah, there, around. there is. So that might be fun, depending on how this yeah. series ends. Um, but uh, <laughs> let's not get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> but our next, our next one will be a talkie, um, yes. and that's uh, the jazz singer, 1927. Yep. Side note: the first western talkie was. You want to know? You want to guess? You know this? Uh, first western talkie. I don't know. It was in old Arizona, 1928. Um, yep, I wasn't even close. Wait, what were you thinking? I was thinking Cimarron, but that might Cimarron. actually be silent. Cimarron? Um, the original Cimarron. I, yeah, because I think it was remade in the, as a talkie. Yeah. It was, well, it was 31, but it might have been silent. Oh. Wow. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's an early to, uh, Best Picture winner. I have to right look there. that up. Cimarron. Why didn't you choose that as our next as our next film? Uh, Is it too much? Too much? We could do that. We'll talk about it. Oh. <laughs> 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 um, We'll let you know what our actual choice is for the 1930s. Stand by. Stand by as we talk. Uh, January 29th, 1920. So we're in the 20s. Walt Disney starts work as an artist with Casey Slide for $40 a week. But of course... Very ambitious young man. Eight years later, he will have uh, introduced a character by the name of Mickey Mouse yes, he will. in the Steamboat Willie. Incredible um, work ethic in those early days. The Charleston is the all the rage as a... As a dance, yep. 1925. Popeye is introduced in the comic strip, 1929. Now, see, I would have thought Popeye would be earlier. Really? Yeah. Well, I mean... I, I don't know. He's just... To me, he's like... He's always there. Well, I mean, 29 is pretty early. It is. I'm, I was kind of... I always look at comic book characters or comic characters in, like, how they relate to Batman, because Batman's <laughs> my thing. And he is, what, nine years before Batman? Eleven years? Yeah. Because uh, Batman is 30, 38. Yeah. No, 39, so it's 10 39. years. Yeah, 10 so Batman's 39 and uh, Popeye's 29, so 10 years apart. So there you not, go. I mean, it's not that late. Yeah. Not that late. I, I do mean, the same thing with movies, only my goalposts are 1939 and 1977. <laughs> those are great goalposts. <laughs> we got, we're going to touch on both of those, I'm sure, yeah. oh, as yeah. the series progresses. Well, two of our candidates for the film of the 30s, the Western of both the 30s, Both of them are from 1939. Are from 1939, except for Cimarron. But... Except for Cimarron, which we... Looks like we're not doing. <laughs> Which we just floated, but... <laughs> right, ben did not like that one. Anyway, the Model T uh, was roughly $260 by the 1920s, approximately $3,500 in today's funds, even though, although that's not, that's affordable car right there. Mm -hmm. That's pretty expensive for the time. Yes. But the auto industry is seriously taking off at this point, uh, as well as uh, automobile fatalities. You want to yeah. do a ballpark guess on how many fatalities in <laughs> I 1924? Not. I do not. I know the number is high. It would be 26,000 automobile uh, associated fatalities. Yeah, people think it's bad now. But, I mean, nobody knew what to do with them. And yeah. Up I mean, until that time, you could just kind of walk in the street in the city. And, yeah. It was and, kind uh, of just still progressing as a oh, the safety restrictions and things like that. We're a lot less likely to get run over by a horse than a car. Yeah, because at least a horse, there's a second brain involved there. <laughs> just like a horse, like, do I really want to run into this guy? Yeah. Um, but with car culture also rises, some food chains. A&W Root Beer is the first fast food chain. 
Fast um, food arises. In 1923, the U.S. U.S. Steel Corps initiates an eight-hour workday, so labor is getting kind of a progressing, I guess, in some cases. Um, it actually takes a downturn. A lot of unions lose membership during the 20s because the economy is so good. Yeah. Uh, the economy yeah. Is, is booming, beside, you know, except for maybe farming. Um, but the cities are growing. Urban, most for the first time, I think the census says that uh, the more Americans were in urban centers rather than the rural rural areas. Hmm. So it is growing population. It's growing in urban. It's growing econ- in the economy. Um, Changing world. You know. Although, let's see what else is going on. Uh, the first well, American explorer, Roy Chapman Andrews, discovers the first recognized dinosaur egg in the Gobi Desert, Mongolia. I, oh. I put that in there because I'm like, dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> they are being developed into our oh, popular man. imagination. We should do a dinosaur series. We should do dinosaurs and pop culture. Talk about Gertie the Dinosaur. I don't know. Gertie the Dinosaur? Gertie the Dinosaur is one of the earliest uh, cartoons. Of dinosaurs? By uh, Well, it's, it's about a cartoon character called Gertie. She's a, she's a brontosaurus. Okay. And it's drawn by none other than the legendary Windsor McKay, who's a great uh, comic artist for uh, Little Nemo in Slumberland. It's his best known work today, comic uh, Sunday. Okay. Sunday paper spread. But also the, the, one of the inventors of the cartoon. Really? Yeah. Gertie the Dinosaur. We gotta go back and look, yeah, look at Gertie. We're gonna go back Gertie. and talk about that. And anyway. also uh, The Lost World, early stop motion classic about dinosaurs oh, as well. From the novel by Arthur Conan Doyle. Yes. Lots of dinosaur All right. stuff. Alright, we gotta go back and do dinosaur stuff. Anyway. <laughs> um, but one statistic, this is from the History Channel. Uh, this kind of blew me away, is that three-fourths of Americans visited the movie theater by the end of the 1920s. Three-fourths? Three-fourths. Uh, of americans so i gotta look think, up what it is today when you think about that that's a huge population for the time film industry is is very big yeah. at this point and speaking of hollywood the hollywood sign is officially dedicated in the hills above hollywood this is 1923 uh in los angeles it is originally reads hollywood, hollywood land, land. Uh, but the four last letters are dropped after renovation in 1949. Yeah. So I didn't know. Crazy it, to think. I didn't know it said Hollywood Land in like True the early story. days of Hollywood. Yeah. That's interesting to me. A little known fact. Um, Hard to even. <laughs> it's become so ubiquitous to think of it as Hollywood. Yeah. The addition of the land. Just yeah. Is so, seems so unnecessary. I guess they thought that in 1949 as well. It's like a. I don't know. It would be like referring to U2 as the U2, <laughs> the band. <laughs> it's like, right. no, there's no, there's no, no article there's no, there. <laughs> or the NSYNC. I mean, no, 90, there's it's no just, the. It's there. just Hollywood. <laughs> this is, this no is land. Hollywood. Uh, also going on in 1923, Firestone Tire, rubber company, starts producing inflatable tires. Big deal there. Renovation. What, what was it before? Was it just like a strip of rubber? It's well, when you think about like. Uh, wagon tires uh-huh. they're just they were basically just wood with a steel rim around it. okay yeah and so you imagine later cars they just kind of built that on and rubber is very kind of expensive anyway at the yeah. time it's because it's produced by trees yeah so the fact i mean you just have like i guess a layer of either metal or rubber surrounding yeah. this wheel uh-huh. and then they started inflating them in 1923 which i'm sure <laughs> made them a lot more comfortable i'd imagine so you can imagine bouncing around on some of those dirt roads oh yeah um awful also going on in 1923, and by the way, this is because this is the year the film is made, so that's why I keep bringing yes, up stuff in 1923. Lee DeForest demonstrates his sound on film moving pictures in New York City, April 15th, 1923. It is the first sound on film public performance shown uh, in New York. Yeah, so like a lot of things in Hollywood history, <laughs> the jazz singer gets the credit, but. Uh, it's not really that simple. There was a lot of experimentation, even back when this film was uh, being made, yeah. with getting sound and pictures synced. Yeah. It even has, uh, at one point, it has a, its own soundtrack, right? Yes, it has its own soundtrack that's recorded um, and played at some venues, but uh, I don't know what's happened to it. I, yeah, I don't think that the the version that we is available on YouTube has a score attached to it, but I don't think it's original. I don't think so. It doesn't uh, 
doesn't have that time. <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting because movies, obviously, movies are very dominant as a form of entertainment compared to today because we have so many other distractions. But in those days, it was a huge production. In fact, that's how Tim McCoy, who we mentioned earlier um, as the Indian Wrangler, that's how he gets his start in Hollywood. He puts together a show to perform before uh, movies where he does like kind of a Wild West live show. Huh. They, they do it before screenings in Hollywood. So that brings him to the attention of uh, studio, studio moguls and gets him more work as an actor. So Wow. That's how he kind of transitioned from Indian Wrangler to <laughs> movie star. <laughs> okay. So The Fighting Fool, Daring Danger... Texas Cyclone, Bulldog Courage. These, These are, are some of his films. B movies, aren't they? Um, Texas Cyclone. That sounds familiar. Is that a John Wayne? Texas Cyclone is a Columbia picture. No, John. Uh, John Wayne is attached. Yeah, he's yeah. a smaller character. That would be an early one of his. Good spot there. Nineteen thirty-two. Yeah, so those sounds like one of the early B movies. Would Columbia have been a, a yeah, B movie studio at Columbia's this point? Columbia B movie studio at that point. They didn't quite uh, make it to the majors. Well, they, they produce a lot of, like, short time. westerns and stuff. Yeah. Uh, an adaptation of the Westerner, 1934. Also a Columbia. Quite a few films here. Ghost Patrol, directed by Sam Newfield. Definitely have seen his posters around and seen some of his films, but only in passing. So this... This kind of ends our first, I don't know, I guess our first chapter of Westerns by the Decade. It does. It's ending the silent era. This is the end of the silent era. And I have to say that this has been very much of an educational for me. Yeah, there's a lot I still don't know about this period. Because I, I think before this I've watched maybe one or two silent films. Yeah. You know, so this is, it's been kind of fun. It's also interesting to watch the rise of the Western. To, yeah. By the time we get to the 40s and 50s, it is it is the genre, to the point that if you're going to make a film by default, yeah. people almost assume it's going to be a Western. And it's going to make so, money. So yeah. dominant as a By the 40s and 50s, yeah. And it is interesting to see in our three films that we picked for this era, uh, you almost see a, a, a sharp mm -hmm. incline here. We're going All of these films are uh, successful. Yeah. But, I mean... Massive success with this one. Which one is your favorite? Of these three? Of these three that we put. I really loved Hell's Hinges. Hell's Hinges is the most challenging and the most rich as a work of that art. Be, I think that would be my favorite as well. Um, but The Great Train Robbery has so much charm. It's a close second. Really? I think this film, as uh, grandiose as it is, <laughs> somewhat lacking... In some areas, although it was very entertaining, it definitely wasn't boring. It's it not slow. They're, they're, it's very slow, but there are parts in it that are really quite fun. Yeah, and the the Ernest Torrance, who's a Scottish actor, by the way, he hails from Edinburgh. Oh, I've seen his picture before. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, he's been around. I don't know if I've actor. seen any other of his films. I don't remember. Did he make it into the talkies? He did. I think he's been in. I think the number is like over 250 films. So he it's quite likely that we've seen his face. Yeah. A good bit, but he uh, he came over as like a touring player, and they cast him in the picture, so he stayed. But it's interesting in this movie, he plays a very all American sort of character. Well, you can't hear him talk, so and besides that, I mean, <laughs> this film is all about America, you know, America and mm -hmm. immigration is kind of a part of that too. So Definitely a big part of that. So I'm sure if he, even if he had the Scottish accent, they'd be like, <laughs> "We're going to cast him anyway as a yeah, Scottish." Well, Scallywag. Wouldn't matter. He yeah. definitely has a sort of like, uh, I don't know, wild man vibe. So. He definitely looks like a wild man in this movie. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to say about it before we depart. Which one was your favorite? I would, I would agree with you. I'd say Hell's, Hell's Hinges was by far the better of the three. Yeah. Um, Some really rich themes and acting there. There is. And The Great Train Robbery, it's, it's just too raw for me. I'm just like, I want I want a movie to have a beginning, an end, a middle. And well, it does. Least, it does, but it's I want it to be permanent. seamlessly <laughs> come through yeah. to the end. Yeah. And this is, it, it's very choppy as far as from viewing it from a modern perspective. Yeah. Um, challenging. So it's very challenging to watch for me. 
And it's like the shortest. It's the shortest one of the three. It is. Yeah. yeah. I thought. Well, I guess it's kind of a closing note to that whole chapter. I should mention the fact that uh, Emerson Howe, the writer of the novel, passes away a few weeks after the premiere of this film. He does. Yeah. So it's the end of an era. Someone who actually, uh, a writer who actually consulted primary sources about the Wild West and was yeah. kind of a creator of the mythology of the West that it has eventually become. That's true. Yeah. Kind of moving on. So next week, <laughs> or I next month, I yeah, I don't think it's going to be next week. <laughs> Next month, we move on to the 1930s. And I think we agreed. I think we agreed on the next film, right? We did. We are going to do Destry Rides Again, starring James Stewart. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. Cause I, like I am it. too. I'm I like excited to actually sit down and watch it. I haven't watched it since I was a small lad. so Yeah, I haven't watched it for a long, long time. So I'm, gonna, I'm excited to go back and see this and then talk about Jimmy Stewart. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, listeners, for joining us and listening to us ramble and go off on tangents and talk about this stuff. If you have, uh, if you want to correct any of our history, <laughs> which I will say, by mid uh, mid nineteenth century history, not my forte. So, if you want to correct me on Abe Lincoln, yeah, on any of those things, Jeff uh, Jim Bridger, by all means. Let us know what the best books to read about Abe Lincoln and J uh, Jim Bridges. We endeavor to be humble, so we are. Uh, yeah. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at popstorian at gmail .com. or on Facebook and also on Twitter. Or both are popstorian. Uh -huh. um, so at popstorian is the Twitter handle there. Yeah. Facebook dot com slash popstorian or something like that. Something along those lines. Just, just type in popstorian. Just, story just you'll search find it. Us. You'll find it. Facebook is good about that. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you, and we'll. Uh, We'll read you, out, read you out on the show. You will. Thanks for listening to the Popstorian podcast. Be sure to subscribe. You can find us online at popstorian.com or on Facebook and Twitter. Tune in next time for more of the history of popular culture. Listener, you should probably cut that last part out. <laughs> Plow on, dear listener. Plow on. Plow on. Go forth and conquer.